So I wanted to talk today about frequency response for both linear and nonlinear uh, oscillators. So this is a pretty classical topic in terms of vibrations. Um, and I'll try to link it with the, um, what we've been saying about phase space and the uh, structure of Hamiltonian systems. And this might get taught in other, other courses. So first I'll talk about frequency response for a linear harmonic oscillator. Where we're looking at a, this is a mass. Um, I, I like to think of it as I often do, just the pendulum and you're kind of driving the pivot of the pendulum. So you're moving the pivot back and forth, or maybe you're doing some kind of torque. Uh, but you could do this for other systems too. So the, the, kind of the setup is that you've got some mass M. Um, we'll do just one degree of freedom, and that is X for the position of, of the mass M. There's a linear restoring force. which is just proportional to the displacement. Um, so this X is displacement from equilibrium. There's also linear damping, just in the absence of some more sophisticated damping. This is, this is what we got, so negative B X dot. And then a, a time-dependent driving force. It might be periodic or it might not. We won't specify. We'll just call it capital F as a function of time. So then we've got M x double dot, just Newton's, Newton's second law is um, negative kx, negative b, x dot, uh, plus ft, okay? Then we'll, we'll put this in a form that's easier to work with. We're gonna divide by m and move some things around so it looks like m x double dot plus, uh, I'll write it this way, two beta, x dot plus omega naught squared x equals f of t where and let me define these things beta which is which is one half b over m this is called the uh the damping ratio And omega naught is just square root k over m. And so that's the, the natural frequency in the absence of damping. And you'll, you'll notice that the units of beta and the units of omega naught are one over time. So you know, one over seconds. Sometimes we write beta um, in terms of a quality factor. So just keep that in mind. Often people will write two beta as one over Q. So if something has a higher quality, that means it has less damping. And there is some, there's a relationship between Q and the energy lost during each cycle of the oscillator, but I'm not really too concerned about that. Um, I guess this shouldn't be capital F, this should be little f t. So got little f of t is just force divided by the mass. So we've got a system it looks like that. Um, 
What about it? Well, we can, uh, we want to analyze what happens to the system. So how does X evolve? We know what X would, you know, basically what X would look like in the absence of any forcing up there. So if forcing was just equal to zero, then the phase portrait would look like, let's say we started at some initial condition and, and we've got damping. Well, we know that this is just going to spiral in due to the damping, okay? But due to forcing, if you have forcing, um, then things could go differently. So if we have F of T is not equal to zero, then starting from that same initial condition, you could have strange things. In fact, this trajectory could cross itself because you've got time involved as well. If you don't have a time dependent uh, vector field, then uh, like the red points, they cannot cross themselves. That would violate determinism. But now this trajectory can seem to cross itself because uh, it's actually not crossing itself at the same time or even at, at the same phase. So you have these apparent crossings. And it's not, there's no guarantee that this is gonna be periodic or anything. It could just do whatever it wants. Um, I also haven't specified that F is a periodic function. So we will consider that. So we're going to specialize to the case of a not just periodic but sinusoidal. So a sinusoidal forcing. Um, function. So f of t is f naught cosine omega t. We'll go with something of that form. Um, so now we're going to seek the function x as a function of time that satisfies this time dependent ODE. X double dot plus two beta X dot plus mega naught squared X equals F naught cosine omega T. So this forcing It's an amplitude F naught, right? And it's gonna go sinusoidally with the period two pi over omega. Not omega naught, but omega. So how is the system going to respond? Like if I have my pendulum and I jiggle it at some high frequency, what's gonna happen? Well, this doesn't seem to do much of anything. What if I do a low frequency? Okay, now it's starting to respond. I must be getting closer to resonance. So something's going on there. All right, so for, um, for any solution of this, we're, we're gonna use a trick. Hand and Finch, so there's two references. I put them in a folder on the, the linear oscillator and resonance. There's uh, Hand and Finch, and I think they just overdo it. They use a Green's function approach. And uh, I don't know if you've learned Green's functions. I kind of remember them from taking electromagnetism and those are horrible memories. So if at all possible, I want to avoid any use of a Green's function. There are these awful things related to integrals. So you can skip all that. And uh, another chapter that I put in there by a guy named uh, Taylor, um, this is a, this is from a physics book and uses a simpler approach that I'm going to use because it's just so much nicer. And what is that approach? So the idea is that for any solution of this boxed equation here with the cosine omega t, um, it's not like there's anything special about cosine, we could have used sine, right? Sine would be uh, basically a phase shift cosine. 
the green curve over there. So if there's going to be a solution to this equation for x, then there could also be a, a solution with cosine omega t replaced by sine omega t. So there's, there's also a solution, and we'll call it y t. y double dot plus 2 beta y dot plus omega naught squared y equals f naught sine omega t. Because this is just, this is just phase shifted compared to the above. And so now we can combine x and y into uh, a complex function, z. And often I'm uh, opposed to doing anything that's complex. Uh, just because I, I get confused with the imaginary stuff but it actually simplifies things here. So we're going to define this complex function uh, c of t, which is x, that's the real part, plus i, y of t. All right, so that's cool. So z is going to be a uh, complex number. x is the real part, y is the imaginary part. Um, if we, so would then we, we multiply this equation for y and multiply it by i and uh, collect the terms. And what do we get? We'll get a nice, um, we get uh, the equation that z must satisfy. Satisfy. And this is it. It looks the same. 2 beta z dot plus omega naught squared z equals, and now we've got f naught uh, cosine omega t plus i sine omega t. And if you remember your complex analysis, you know that this part can be written in a very nice way. It can be written in terms of the uh, complex exponential function. So we can write this as e to the i omega t. All right. Now this, it might not seem that we've done any kind of tremendous advance, but uh, because of the simple properties of the exponential function, this complex equation is actually much easier to solve than either of those real equations. So this is our complex equation. And then uh, if we can find a solution for z, we just take the real part and voila, we've got a solution for, uh, for x. All right, so we're gonna assume a form for the solution. Um, so let's just, let's try, a solution of the form z t equals um, c e to the i omega t, where c, Getting a just want to go back to my screen where C is a it's a complex constant. So we'll try that. If we just substitute this guess into this equation and work it out, what do we get? 
um, well, because of the nice properties of the exponential, right? We take two derivative, two time derivatives of that exponential, and we'll get uh, right i squared omega, which means uh, sorry, i squared omega squared. So that gives us a negative omega squared plus two i beta omega plus omega naught squared c e to the i omega t equals and then the right hand side doesn't change but what do you know it has that exponential there so so we have a solution um, if c satisfies certain things you can think of the the exponentials cancel out and We have a solution if c is uh, equal to one. If c equals f naught over omega naught squared, I'll write it this way. Just rearrange a little bit to i beta omega. Now, before we take the real part of z, we want to um, write this complex coefficient c in a more convenient form. So we'll write C as C equals A e to the negative I delta, where A is real and delta is real. So any, any complex number can be written in this form. Um, and we're just choosing this because A will be the, act, the, the real amplitude. Now to identify A and delta, uh, well, A, A squared is going to equal to the, uh, the modulus of the complex number C. So that's the same as C times C uh, conjugate which if you work that out, what do you get? Um, I guess for those of you who don't remember, let me, this would be C and its complex conjugate would be just, anytime you've got I, you switch it to negative I. So negative two I beta omega. All right, you work that out. And what do you get? F squared, F naught squared over, and I'll group these omega naught squared minus omega squared plus four beta squared omega squared. And you can uh, similarly using your, your background in complex analysis, you could find what delta is, and delta is the arc tangent to beta omega divided by omega naught squared minus omega squared. Okay, um, so so this is useful. Let me just write what a is. A is square root of that thing, and right, this is going to be, this is a, a real number. And you notice it's a function of omega, uh, there shouldn't be two omega knots there, just one of them. There's a func it's a function of omega and omega naught. So um, we can even see where this is going to be the largest this amplitude is going to be the largest at omega naught. So now, now we've got what we want. So we've got z t equals uh, c to the e i omega t, which equals a e to the i omega t minus delta, with a given by this and delta given by this. 
And now we can take the real part. Because x is the real part of this. And um, what do we get? We get x is a cosine omega t minus delta. So this is, this is not the total solution. This is just a solution to this. Let me sneak up to this equation up here, this equation star. We wanted to find a solution for that. What we have found through making this guess is uh, going into the complex plane and then coming back to the real world. Uh, what we found is the steady state solution. So this is the steady state. solution. There would also in general be a transient solution. So you might say x as a function of time is this steady state solution plus something that's transient. And because it's not important of what I wanted to talk about, I just want you to know that this transient solution uh, it dies out exponentially. So it's got a term in it that's uh, exponential uh, minus beta t, and beta is positive. It represents damping. So that transient part will disappear. So what does that look like if you were to actually drive the system and get things going? Um, there's two views that we can look at we could look at the uh the phase space view and then we could look at like x as a function of time um let me do the phase space view because that connects with what we were doing last time remember in terms of a if you've got if you've got a time periodic system then you can and if represent it in terms of this stroboscopic map. And so what we've got is there's some initial condition. So this is at time t, and then this is t equals two pi over omega. So this is the period of the forcing. We always look when we do this stroboscopic map stuff at the period of the forcing. So if I, uh, there's some, this is the steady state solution that I'll, I'll be showing here. It does something and then comes back. And if you were to look at what its trace looks like, it probably looks like it's traced as, it seems to trace out a loop. But of course you have to be, you're, at, you're, you're on this thing at a particular phase. So um, if I chose some other initial condition on here, it might not come back to the same loop. It might do something else. Um, but because of the fact that we've got uh, that transients die out, if this is the steady state solution, so let's call this X steady state, other initial conditions are going to converge onto this steady state solution. So the steady state solution is an attractor. So if we've got some other solution, it, um, it will eventually convert, and it, it might converge very quickly. It depends on how large beta is. So start anywhere in, in the phase space, and you know, maybe this thing takes a while, but it'll eventually join up. So for this system, The steady state solution is a is an attractor. In fact, because it attracts all initial conditions, uh, we call it a global attractor. You could also have uh, situations where maybe a certain response is just a local 
attractor. So it doesn't attract globally, globally meaning every in, in initial condition. So that's what things look like in terms of the phase space view, the uh, time series view. It's good to kind of keep both of these in mind. Um, I'm gonna use a, there was a, a numerical example. I'm not gonna do the MATLAB code for it, but there was a, a, a numerical example in, the, in Taylor's book. And I think this shows things pretty nicely. You can insert that file. Um, yeah. No. So this is illustrating the same thing. So we've got our driving force as a function of time, right? So this is F naught. This is the period of the forcing. And this is the resulting motion. This is what X does. So you'll see over the long term, we're in the steady state. In the steady state, it's not uh, one to one. If you were to look at peaks here, peaks here, there's a little bit of a delay. And that delay, the delay is equal to delta. So it's kind of a phase shift of the resulting motion compared to the driving force. It lags. Um, and this transient, this transient stuff goes away. So this transient would be this, this, all this kind of extra oscillations. So transient dies away. And all we're left with is the steady state response. And the steady state response is uh, significant. There's no amplitude shown here. But one of the interesting things about this expression is it reveals to us how, in steady state, how big will our oscillation response be compared to the input driving force, right? We can, um, if I do this square root slightly differently, I pull out an F, and so I've just got square root on the bottom. So you could look at what is, what is the amplitude you get out as a function of the amplitude you get in? What's the ratio of those two? The ratio of those two is this function. And this peaks at omega equals omega naught. But then it's got, it, it looks sort of Gaussian. So that's the, it's called the frequency response curve. And you might uh, put in parentheses, have it. that's the steady state frequency response curve. So this is always frequency omega the driving frequency. This is the amplitude um, compared to the input. So we might we sometimes call that the response. And here is uh, the natural frequency of the system. So you get some peak response there, but then it sort of, it falls off symmetrically. And this width, we might call this the, uh, the full width at half maximum. Um, just generally think of it as the width of the response. This depends on the damping. So either through beta or Q. So this would be like an intermediate value. If you went to a really high, uh, really low damping, so really high Q, then you would get a higher peaked response. Um, 
So this is for lower damping. Higher Q. Lower beta. As Q goes to uh, infinity, right, this, look at the expression here, uh, meaning as beta goes to zero, this term gets becomes very, very small. And so at omega equals omega naught, this is zero. So all you're left with is uh, what looks like a delta function. So as Q goes to infinity, as you lower damping, you get this huge response, but over a very narrow band. So that might not be uh, very good. Depends on what you're after. Okay, so this is the frequency response curve idea. Um, and if I set this up right, I wanted to show you at least doing this for the pendulum. Now, this is resonance. Would you agree? Okay, let me, let me do resonance. that. Okay, so now oh. he's moving his, his fingers My hand very little. That's the driving oh, no force. More. And then he's getting that large effect out of it. No more. And yet I see an amplitude there of. All right, so now we can finally talk about nonlinear resonance. Um, and frequency response curves. So we've already kind of seen the motivation from that, that computation. Now I'm following uh, Hand and Finch because they discussed this, I think at a pretty good level. So this is in section 10.4. Hand and Finch. And the equation that I was simulating, um, I'm now using X, I'm at Q instead of X, but hopefully you get it. So this is the duffing equation. And we're going to add a forcing. So we'll add a forcing term which just looks like the force from before. So th there's an implied omega naught squared equals one. So it's kind of like we've normalized so that the natural frequency of the system is one. Um, and we've also, uh, if you wanted to be very careful, right, we've got Q double dot plus Q dot over big Q, here's the damping. So we're gonna consider the no damping case. So that's Q goes to infinity. So that term will just drop out. So we wanna know what happens to the frequency response curves. Um, we're gonna do a harmonic analysis and suppose that epsilon equals 0.1, so kind of small, and the forcing is one, uh, amplitude one and frequency one, and the damping is off. Okay, yeah, it's, you should be seeing MATLAB. And what I'm gonna try to do is, I've got an equation, uh, let's see, we can, my ODE fun, let's open that. So this is exactly like what we already looked at. Um, here I've got F cosine omega T, this F should be F naught. And the only thing that's changed is instead of uh, writing the damping in terms of two times beta, I'm writing it as one, uh, one over Q. And we've got this term, which is a nonlinear term. So we're looking at a nonlinear oscillator. So this is called the driven anharmonic uh, oscillator. Um, and maybe I'll try to restart my computer while this is going on. Yeah, we'll see. All right, so that's what I'm going to simulate. Uh, I'm using a really high Q, so that's basically getting rid of the effective damping. Uh, epsilon is the coefficient in, in front of the, the cubic nonlinear term. 
uh, forcing frequency of one and input amplitude of one. And then this is just the initial uh, position. I've got one zero. So I'm starting on the X axis. I'll integrate this from time zero to 10. Um, and you'll see what happens, hopefully, if I were to run this. Okay, I've got the plot over here. So I started at this initial condition, which is at one, zero, and it's going around doing something like that. Um, what I'm looking for is a periodic orbit. And this does not appear to be periodic. What if I followed it for 100 time units? What would I see? Okay. Oh, maybe it, maybe it did do something periodic. I don't know. Actually, no, I don't think so. It just came, unless it did a really sharp turn there. So maybe. I'd like it to kind of come back and do something else. So I'll do a period of two. I will clear my screen. Um, not a period of two, an initial condition of two. So I'm just using a slightly different initial condition. Oh, and then went for 100 time units. Don't want that. Only want 10 time units. Let me move some things around here so you can see better. All right, now uh, run me. Okay, so I did this for just 10 time units. What if I do 20 time units? It looks like it's almost coming back. It does a few loops. It's almost coming back. Um, and I can trust that this is probably a pretty good solution because uh, like I encourage you to do when you do simulations, be aware of what the tolerance is for your uh, ODE solver. In this case, I've chosen a ridiculously small tolerance, three times 10 to the negative 14, um, which is like close to the limit that MATLAB will give me. And it's really fast, so why not do it? Like, let's, let me do something different. Let me see if it gives something totally different. Now, probably have to do pretty terrible for it to show anything. Okay, yeah, there it did badly. It's doing something significantly different. Okay, so let's stick with 10, three times 10 to the negative 14. Um, and what if I do 2.4? because I think I'm getting close to something that might be periodic. Oh, that looks really close to periodic. Um, yeah, I like that. Is it coming, is it coming really close? Yeah, it's coming really close. It's going around a few times too. Um, what if I do 2.402, you know, just something, something really small. And is it running? Yeah, there we go, okay. It still looks periodic and hopefully it is indeed periodic. At least to some really high precision. You can see, yeah, it's, I mean, it's close. It's not exactly coming back, it's kind of spiraling in. So I could keep adjusting this number. I could come up with an algorithm to, uh, um, depending on where I cross this line, do small adjustments and turn this into a zero finding problem to, to close that gap down to zero and find something truly periodic. Uh, but the goal here is to do something kind of like Linstead Poincaré, where we come up with approximations um, to approximate the uh, periodic steady state motion. So the only difference between this problem and the previous problem, like I said, is that nonlinear term. And when you look at the nonlinear system, you have to um, you have to use a different set of tools. So we found a periodic solution, or pretty close to a periodic solution. And it has the same period of the forcing. So, right, two pi over omega. So two pi, Just remember the frequency of forcing. So omega is one. So that was our numerical example. And 
it had uh, an initial condition here of, I forget what it was, 2.4020. And if, as we followed that around, it seemed to come very close to coming back to itself. So it's very likely that we're very close to a true um, solution. And if we were to look at what that solution gives us, It'll give us, let's see, yeah, something, and if it's really periodic, oops, it'll give us something that's really periodic and keeps re repeating. And hopefully you have learned uh, from Fourier series analysis that you can take any periodic function so uh, like, like this, even if it's not sinusoidal, and this equals a sum of uh, sinusoids. In fact, for this problem, it's just the cosines, which we can show. So this is the Fourier series representation. or it's sometimes called the Fourier series decomposition. So what this says is this periodic function Q can be written as there's a constant term plus an infinite sum, and goes from one to infinity of these terms a n is some, these are constants, and cosine n omega t plus b n sine n omega t. And as you go to higher and higher n, you go to uh, more and more faithful representation of your periodic function. And these a n's and b n coefficients come from doing a in, in inner product and function space. But you probably just learned it as, okay, a n is omega over, oh, it's omega over pi uh, integrating from zero to pi over omega. So integrating over a period, q, your given function, cosine n omega t dt, and bn is omega pi. Integrate over one period, q, with sine n omega t. If you've seen anything on Fourier series, hopefully this looks familiar to you. Now, the, um, we can get rid of some of these terms because the original ODE has time reversal symmetry. So we only need the cosines. So what this means is that all of the BN uh, equals zero. What do we mean by time reversal symmetry? Well, here's our, let me show the function here. And this is without damping. I think you lose time reversal symmetry when you have the damping back in. Cosine omega t. Okay, so that's our, this, this is the original ODE that we're looking at. Time reversal symmetry means if you take the time and then just look at negative time. So here's like our function Q um, here's Q at time T. If you say T goes to negative T, then, oops, then the derivative with respect to time goes to the negative of that derivative. If you take two derivatives with respect to time, well, you get a negative of a negative, so you recover just the regular um, derivative, which means that 
uh, we have Q double dot going to Q double dot. And Q goes to Q. If we let Q go to Q, that means a Q cubed goes to Q cubed. Uh, cosine negative omega t equals cosine omega t. So the equation is unchanged under a time reversal symmetry, under, under time reversal. That's what time reversal symmetry means. Equation is unchanged. Which means that if you have Q going, uh, if you have a solution going forward in time, then there's a mirror image solution, Q, going backward in time for as far as you'd want to go. What this means is we've got, um, the solution is an even function, not an odd function. So since the signs are odd functions, they're all gone. So all we have are cosines. So that gives us some simplification. There's also some other weird symmetry. Um, it's, this is a procedure I use with my students um, that I advise that uh, if you are analyzing some simple ODE, look at its symmetries because that puts constraints on the types of solutions you can have. So I also have a, a symmetry that I have a hard time putting a name on it. It's basically if t goes to not negative t, but t plus pi, then q goes to negative q. And that's a little harder to draw, but it means that the, this means that the cosine two, K uh, omega t terms go away for a k equal to some integer. So that leads to even uh, uh, more simplification. So we only have odd frequencies. Odd numbered cosines, if you want. So QT is um, maybe even that constant goes away. So all we're left with is n equals one, three, five, all the odd numbers, a n cosine and omega t. So that's kind of nice. And what I don't have time for, but could show, um, is uh, something that we can compute. We can compute if we wanted to, or numerically, from that solution I had of Q as a function of time, we could calculate what the first amplitude is. You would just do omega over pi, and then you would integrate over one period, the kind of numerical representation of that function Q that we have, and then cosine omega t. And if you were to calculate that, we would get something close to 2.356. So that means to a first approximation, this is, what we have is just a cosine wave. But if we actually took Q, took the numerical solution that, that we found, the solution of that ODE, 
and then subtract it off this approximation. We would get something and what you would see is that we would get something um, if this was uh, two pi, remember that's one period, we would get something that had, I guess it has to be, one, two, three. We would get something with a frequency of three omega. which we would expect a dominant frequency of three omega. Which means we could go now to the next term in the approximation, A3, calculate A3 numerically. Pi over omega. Calculate this, the integral of Q times cosine three omega t dt. And um, this is a pretty, I mean, I'm kind of sketching it as a small amplitude, but it, it ends up being small, uh, 0.046. And I'll provide that code for you if you wanna try this out. So that means to a pretty good approximation, we've got, something of this form, the next term would be uh, with cosine three omega t. And I think, I think the, ne the next error term is pretty small. It's kind of like you move over two decimal places each time. Um, now, if we plug this, plug this into the ODE, What do we get? And I'll call this equation, so I'll, I'll be referring to it. So if we just plug that into the ODE, we're gonna get Q double dot equals minus A1 omega squared cosine omega T minus A3 nine omega squared cosine three omega T epsilon Q to the third is epsilon A1 cosine omega T plus A3 cosine three omega T raised to the third power. Let's just keep the leading order term epsilon A1 to the third power cosine omega T raised to the third power plus other things higher order terms. Um, cosine raised to the third power, I'll just go ahead and write that out. So from a trig identity, you would get this. There's terms that seem kind of familiar from the um, lindstedt poincare method. So that means Equation star, our ODE, is now got one minus omega squared A1 cosine omega T plus one minus nine omega squared A3 cosine three omega T plus epsilon three fourths A1 cubed cosine omega t plus epsilon one fourth a one cubed cosine three omega t. All of this equals F naught cosine omega t. Now we want coefficients of the nth harmonic to vanish.
that means coefficients of cosine and omega t. So we, we just equate them. We find all of the terms that have cosine omega t So here's cosine, the cosine omega t terms. And it gives us one minus omega squared a1 plus epsilon three fourths a1 cubed equals f naught. And all of the uh, terms that depend on the next harmonic, which is three omega t. So what is that? We got just this and this. What do we get? Uh, one minus nine omega squared, A3 plus epsilon one fourth A1, the third equals zero. And what does this tell us? Well, we're going to use this. Um, we were sort of motivated by that initial numerical example, but this gives us a prescription for finding for any given F naught and any given omega, you could solve for A1. All right. Assuming that uh, all that the first two harmonics are, are the most important, then given the driving frequency and the driving amplitude, you could solve, use this to solve for A1, the amplitude of the first harmonic. And then once you've got the amplitude for the first harmonic, A1, you could put that in here. And then you would use this to solve for A3. And if we wanted to, we could continue this for any, up to any harm, harmonic. So et cetera, for A5, A7, and so on, as precise as we wanted to, to get. What this gives you, uh, because there is a cubic term, A cubic, and this is where I will end, the cubic term, A1 cubed, suggests the possibility of multiple coexisting solutions for a given frequency of forcing omega. So if we were to plot uh, that initial amplitude A1 versus omega, uh, we could get we could get frequency response curves that are actually tilted. So they show something like that. It's a tilted frequency response curve. And it's due to the nonlinearity that was present in the problem. That uh, cubic term in the ODE. So that means for some uh, frequency, like this frequency here, you could have, there's no one unique response that the system will have. It might have one of three responses. But I will tell you, even like for this, for cases like that, not all three are stable periodic solutions. So we'll have to talk about uh, what happens next time, 
but just to give you an idea, here's uh, Q and Q dot, you'll find that there'll be, uh, like one of these is the large amplitude one up here, and that's stable. And this bottom amplitude one is stable. But then there'll be a the intermediate one. And maybe I'll draw that as a dashed line. And that's going to be unstable. And so these are, um, the, the two that you would observe might be the red one or the orange one because they're stable. So this gets to the idea of uh, a local attractor. If you start with an amplitude that's below that green dashed line, then you're in the region of attraction of this low amplitude response. And if you're above that green line, you're in the region of attraction for the larger amplitude response or attractor. And finding the stability is something we'll just have to get to next time because I have run out of time completely. But that's it. Uh, 